Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Russ Jones. And Brad Kennan. We are wide open. How are you? Fine. How are you doing? Good to see you. I see you too. You're looking... Gray? No. <laughs> the abominable snowman. Right. Well, I mean, I'm... I'm gray too. I think it's been one year since, you know, I let this stuff on my face grow and it used to be black and white. Now it's just like gray. Yeah. I saw somebody the other day and they're like, Hey, your beard's matching your hair. It's not red anymore. I'm like, well, thanks. Thanks. Kicking <laughs> up man's down. Watch you kicking. Jeez. So anyway. All right. So you got what a question what, for do what? You got a question for me? What do you want to do? I, I got a question for you this evening. Okay. I know you have a lot of questions. You are the man of questions. questions. What states have the highest number of Bigfoot sightings and why? Okay. So the highest states are the Pacific Northwest, okay. Washington, Oregon, California. Are they in that order? Yes. Okay. And the reason why is because whatever Bigfoot may be, it came across in all likelihood Beringia or the Bering Strait and came to the United States. So it only makes sense that it would be up there and then would spread following territory, mate, food across the rest of the United States. And we there is a researcher out there that still believes that there are no Bigfoot east of that area, correct? Yeah, uh, I mean, probably a lot, but uh, uh, was it Peter Burns Peter. doesn't believe anyone that's had more than one sighting of Bigfoot, and he doesn't believe that there's any Bigfoot in the eastern United States. Okay. Are we essentially out of the Pacific Northwest? All right. So what state's fourth? Uh, Ohio is four. Why? I mean, we're all the way out here in the Midwest. Why are we fourth? I don't know. You know... Uh, Ohio is an interesting state because you have part of the state is in Appalachia. You have it's one of the states that have water leading to both the southern U.S. and the northern U.S., which is unusual. So there's always water, a lot of cropland. Um, I I think a large part of it is because, you know, you have to have a witness and a Bigfoot to have a sighting. And Ohio man has. I don't know how many how many conferences in Ohio Bigfoot conferences. I mean, the huge uh, one, the Ohio Bigfoot conference, uh, probably three at least. I mean, there's Creature Weekend. I mean, I think I'm thinking there's like maybe six or seven. Okay, but and there may not be. And you have to think that Ohio is what the only state in the United States that has six cities with over a million people. I think six or seven. You know, so you probably have legitimately fifty people taking reports in Ohio. Yeah, I'm you know, not to. I yeah, I mean, them, I don't get that many. So, well, you know, the BFRO, you're in the BFRO and you do most of the ones in Central Ohio. And so, you know, and people would be shocked how many reports that you get literally just miles from downtown Columbus, Ohio, which is Absolutely. what the 16th largest city in the country. Correct. So, so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, in West Virginia, we have, you know, there's like maybe three guys collecting reports. Well, and, you know, if you drive from uh, Ashland, Kentucky, Huntington, West Virginia, you know, on the western side of the state, all the way over to the Panhandle near D.C., it's a six-hour interstate drive, you know, and you only have three guys. The whole state, you know, it's the only state that's completely inside Appalachia, you know, so the whole state is likely Bigfoot territory, and you only have three guys doing reports and well, a very small population. Well, as I say, you have a small population. Plus, you know, you do that interstate drive, which I've done it many times. You know, those hills are straight up and down. Yeah. A lot of them. So people aren't going there, you know, loggers maybe. But, you yes. know, how many loggers are going to, you know, you got uh, a guy logging a coal mine and it's driving to work and he sees a Bigfoot. Do you honestly think he's going to have a, you know, submit his report? Probably not. I treat a lot of them and, you know, I have them looking. Right. You know, when they're on their logging paths, their logging roads, when they're going to get their dozers and stuff or whatever. Because, you know, it happened all the time out west. But, I mean, they kind of have, uh, you know, they have different soil out there. Some of it will hold prints for weeks. And, you know, here in Appalachia, you know, there's many reports that, you know, they'll step over roads or step in the middle. And I was thinking about that last week. I was on some road. I was walking for miles that no one's ever on. You know, as long as you stay in the middle, no one could see it. You know, if you it walked on the edge, it, 
you know, it'd leave a track, but, but I think most of it is just that you just don't have, there's 1.4 million people in West Virginia. That's less than the city of Columbus by itself Correct. and Cleveland and uh, Cincinnati too. So there's just not a lot of people around to right. have reports. Well, do you know what state has kind of had a rise in Bigfoot sightings here in the Midwest? No, no. I, th I know what state it's a state just South of Ohio and okay. it's, has to do with one guy. Can you believe that one guy has pushed up the numbers in the state of Kentucky? Now that you said that, I can believe that. And you know, you know who that guy is, and we're going to bring him on the show right now. Mr. Charlie Raymond of the Kentucky Bigfoot Research. And one of our good friends. One of our good friends. That we, we see a lot. Right. <laughs> welcome to Charlie. Welcome. welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you, man. How how are things in Kentucky doing okay over there? Oh, yeah. I've got reports coming in um, as as we speak. Um, Do you take reports every week, Charlie? You get reports every week? Uh, no, I wouldn't say every week, but every month. Yeah, there's, that's there's the same with me, probably. Yeah. yeah, every month. Yeah, you really are, truthfully, someone that, uh, you know, in, in a few states, um, like Illinois – um, what do we say? It was Stan Courtney was Stan taking Courtney. reports and, um, you know, in different States there are certain guys that really drive up the numbers in that state because they're so attentive to, you know, Bigfoot research and taking reports and their name becomes well known. And I think that anyone that thinks Kentucky, you know, in Bigfoot, they always think of Charlie for sure. Well, hey, how many times, how many libraries do you go visit on a yearly basis? Um, library slash municipal buildings that you know you get all the schools in, you have a school yeah i i would say the the libraries 10 10 to 12 uh, a year um and the only reason i got lucky on those libraries <laughs> in kentucky there's something called a listserv for librarians and it's a private blog uh website where they share information on possible authors uh you know subject matter to bring in, people into the library sure and luckily i got into that and i had great reviews great turnouts and wasn't all because of me it's, it's the topic to be honest and uh, i mean let's not sell yourself short here yeah we've you heard know. you speak you're you're pretty accomplished you're you're very entertaining let's just yeah. say that well thank you i you know i was a middle school teacher like like Cliff was a teacher for many years. So we're used to trying to keep our audience captive. So I will sometimes stand on my head to <laughs> get your attention, but um, I'm passionate as you guys know about yeah. this. And I think that comes through. Are you as passionate now as you used to be about it? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's times, you know, you get discouraged with the Bigfoot world and the politics and the, the hoaxes and the uh, the pareidolia images that you get. Um, so, Explain yeah, to the people what, what that means, Charlie, when you say that. You know, a lot of listeners that we have are not necessarily Bigfoot people. Okay. Pareidolia is the basically, I like to say, the innate ability of humans to see faces. As a baby, we're kind of born with that uh you know, ability to see a face, to recognize a face. So when you look at the man in the moon or you look in the woods at shadows, it's easy to pull out eyes and a mouth and a nose out of just sticks and branches and shadows and, and people circle them. And what happens is they don't get it. When you zoom in on any picture, it becomes pixelated. It matrix, it matrix. And then all of a sudden you see faces and I've got a ton of them lately. And it, it was so funny because I was on a podcast recently and the gentleman said, Hey, what do you think about this dog man face? And he didn't expect me to say what I said because he showed it on the screen. I go, okay, do me a favor, take your mouse and move up to the top right there. Do you see that raccoon? Oh yeah. It looks like a raccoon. It's not a raccoon. It's shadows. I go look down to the left there. Do you see that um, 
that ghostly figure, the eyes and the mouth. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see that. Well, that's all you're seeing are these um, fixation and uh, matrixing of these images when you zoom in on them. Well, and you know, the, the, the sad part is, is, um, you know, there's a, a very, 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 very popular podcaster out there that does not believe in Bigfoot. He brought this up the other day. And, you know, he always brings up the fact that, well, I've seen these images and there's seven red circles saying there's seven Bigfoots looking at me or whatever that is. You know, they don't exist. Well, no, these people are just stupid. You know, they're looking for something that's not there. Um, but there is, you know, quite a bit of data out there, uh, a bunch of proof that shows that this these things exist. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, you do expeditions. How many expeditions do you do in your Charlie? Three or four? I do I do two, uh, two for my organization, and I do one for Matt Moneymaker. Okay, so you do three a year. So, but you go out all the time. I mean, you're. I mean, I always see pictures of you out in the woods and things like that. Um, you know, people really want to hear the good stuff. So I know you have a good story. Number one that we may I may ask about later. Um, that we talked about the last conference we were at, and number two. Have you had any close calls in the woods? You know, things that just like, hey, you know, I'm done. I, you know, you're a big guy. Um, you go to the gym a lot. Yeah. Have um, you had a big call, you know, those close calls that you kind of just, uh, you said, I think oh, that he I'm, just I'm made his here. wife afraid. Of, I remember seeing something on the internet that, uh, his, his lovely wife Lindsay was running out of the woods. He, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, that wasn't that long ago, was it? Just, just recent. Um, we were out investigating. Actually, it was a dog man encounter. And we went oh, to wait that. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah. I'm calling time out. Wait a second. So Bigfoot doesn't bother me. And I know this is a touchy subject for us. <laughs> I know. Dog man. And, and number one, I just, I'm sorry. I'm just going to, just like the guy that you say sees pixelated whatever, uh, there's there's no dog, man. I'm just telling you right now. I don't I don't get it. I don't see it. I, I call time out. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's hard to phantom. And there's no, a Bigfoot you can give an ex, explanation, explanation for. You can say it's a, a relic hominid, um, you know, came across the Bering Strait land bridge with all the other animals from Asia and dispersed across the u.s and it yeah, um, makes sense we have a fossil record that it could be tied to yeah uh, but a big a dog man is different and i'm not going to go into that tonight but i do have a i do have about four legit reports and i'm telling you i've, I've been doing this for a long time three decades of interviewing law enforcement park rangers teachers parents uh you know housewives you name it and I've got a degree in psychology, so I really narrow down the legit stuff, throw out the BS. I've got like four I think are legit. They're honest people. And the only reason I say dogmen is these things had muzzles. Okay, so. And ears, like ears. Not, not a Bigfoot, you don't see the ears. And you don't see a muzzle. These things had that crap. And Okay, so, <laughs> so you got four good stories. That's Let's, why you were spooked, didn't it? When you were yes. in the woods, because what you were thinking of dog man. Okay. What's the best one? And then we're going to get into. Well, okay. I won't get into the story itself. You can go to my YouTube and okay. listen, you can listen to that guy tell that story. But okay. we right. went to the location. It's dark. It's eerie. There's not a sound. Um, it's creepy even in the daytime we went there. And so we went back at night and same thing. Not a sound. It's, it's so far back in the woods when you park and walk this trail. There's no signs of human, you know, no tire tracks, no, no garbage. And it's eerily quiet, not a, not a cicada, uh, no wind. And we were both out there and I kid you not, we just parked the truck. We walked around the gate, <clears throat> not even 50 yards, <clears throat> sorry, 50 yards in. And I said, let's try some tree knocks. So she makes three tree knocks and I'm not exaggerating. If you know me, I don't exaggerate or make crap up. We got a return knock immediate. And we're like, oh, my God, that's great. I got the whole thing on video so you could watch it if you want. Um, and we're like, man. And then we heard walking. And 
He looked at me and I looked at her. Oh. I go, it sounds like it's coming towards us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we head back to the truck and I'm filming too. Like I'm actually got my camera and I'm, I go, hold on, stop. While you're running, you're filming? Yes, you can see it. <laughs> and I, I'm not really running. I'm, I'm walking fast, Russ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I stop her and I'm trying to record. I go, explain what happened. So she's explaining it. And uh, she's kind of soft, you know, soft spoken. And she said, we just did three knocks. We heard a knock and then we heard something moving. And as she said that, I go, I can still hear it. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and you see the camera go like this as we're running back to the truck. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I would tell you, I've been scared. I don't mind using the word scared. I mean, I know most of these creatures won't hurt you. I've got so many reports of close encounters where they're just curious. The Bigfoot goes one way. The human goes the other way. So I know they're not going to hurt us except for that one, you know, that one time they will. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm worried about that one time. Yeah, I've been in areas where, and Russ knows some areas that, I, that he's been there. There's too many reports. There's reports from park rangers, law enforcement. I've had dozens of interactions. Like I'm talking, you knock on a tree, it knocks right back. There's no doubt. And you knock again, it knocks right back. You know, and I can go on and on about that. But I've been in these spots where it does it. And you're like three, four miles back. And it's only always when you're like by yourself or you're with one other person, you know, because, um, you know, there's safety in numbers. And, right. uh, I didn't have that. So when, um, hold on, this is, uh, my screen popped up there. Um, when something does that and I'm knocking on a tree, it's knocking back and it's coming closer and closer and closer. And I know where we're at and the sun's going down and I know I got a three mile hike back and it's just, you know, me and one, one other person, I check it out. I, if, if I could only go back and do it again, and hold my ground and get my, my get my phone out. Who knows? Maybe right. I got a video. But I, I just get I get nervous. And that's like all those people out there that videotape one, right? You see them. How come you didn't videotape it longer? How come the camera's shaking? I kid you not. When you're there, you're scared. I don't care what people say. You start to shake. If you see one especially, you're going to shake. You're going to leave. There's not many people that will stay there and watch a, you know, seven to 10 foot monster, if you will, come, come towards you. Who's going to do that? I don't think many people would. No. So do you always tell yourself the next time I'm going to get in this position, I'm, I'm going to freaking stay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to move. I'm holding my ground. I say what that. happens. I say that a lot. And, um, and I, I have not done that yet. I, I keep, I leave um there's been a couple cases where i stayed and i don't want to get into all those but nothing happened but um again i don't believe they're going to actually hurt you you know i think they'll intimidate you and so forth but um it's it's really hard to get a good video or picture of one because of that yeah why do you think that we haven't had the history of dogman reports until like you know, I mean, this last several years here, it's really became popular. Do you have an explanation for that? <laughs> yeah, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is, a, I mean, more communication now than ever. Yeah. You know, so people that had those, I mean, Moneymaker started collecting reports of the internet was not what, 1993 when the, the, you know, it was very primitive. And that was the first reports. And I remember we just had him when he was saying it was like in, two weeks or something, they started getting reports that were legitimate. You know, there was no avenue for them. And that's like when the TV show came on, you know, it was 10, a big hit show. At one point, you know, I had 2 million viewers or something in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of reports because I, I, I don't think that people knew that Bigfoot made noise until that TV show, yep. you know, largely people, you know, so we got all these reports now, you know, we don't get as many reports because there's so many other places for people to turn reports into. And I think a lot of the old reports that were out there, we've collected them now because those people, you know, 
reached out to us when all these shows started and everything. And now we've got those and now it's just the newer ones. You know, I mean, I still get the older ones, you know, every few weeks or something, but not like I used to. Well, think about just the videos and the images that come out, you know, on a weekly basis. There's always some new piece of video that comes out on Instagram or Twitter or whatever it is. And it's a, you know, a 10 second clip of a Bigfoot jumping through Russia or, you know, whatever it is. And it could be completely fake, but those people do have an avenue to get that stuff out. It doesn't have to be on television. They don't have to submit a report. They send it to a, an Instagram, you know, guy and say, here's my video. He puts it yeah. out there. Hey, you know, think about what it is. It could be real. It could be not. Who cares? It's going to get me some clicks and some views. So I'm yeah, gonna he just wants it content. Yeah, it's content. They're just looking for content. And that's, that's what's a shame. And it's funny you brought that up. My brother weekly will send me a TikTok video of a Bigfoot. I've never seen before. It's a video uh, of a trail cam picture of something moving. And it looks pretty good. I don't know the, the backstory. Yeah. I'm like, that could be real. We don't know now because there's so many hoaxes and you don't know what's real or not anymore. So it doesn't matter. I mean, if you get the best video now, it's not going to matter. It's going to take a body. Yeah. I know that the, that show, uh, I think it's called paranormal caught on camera. Mm -hmm. There's a guy in Ohio that takes pride in trying to get on the show and he's yeah. done some stuff, Bigfoot stuff. Some things are ghost stuff, but you know, he just kind of, so I'm sure if it's one guy in Ohio, that there's a guy, you know, in a lot of States that are trying to do that. Yeah. Just for the clicks, the views. Um, yeah. But, 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 but it was crazy about that. What's bad about it. The social media, all these different avenues is creating that. Although now we have more cameras in the field. We have more cell phones, drones. There's more video coming in. So some could be real. Some could be fake. But there seems like there's a ton right now coming coming through. Right. You know, Charlie, we didn't get a chance to ask you. I guess we got on some other subject because I'm always rambling around. But so why do you think that there are so many reports in Kentucky? What is it about Kentucky that makes, you know, it a good Bigfoot place? The bourbon. <laughs> like right here. <laughs> uh no, actually here you talked about it earlier, Russ. You have to have two things. You have to have a, a Bigfoot and a person to mm -hmm. have a report. Kentucky, we're dispersed all through these hills and hollers. Any street you go on, basically, if you make a wrong turn, you're in the woods. Mm -hmm. So these Bigfoots are in close proximity to humans in Kentucky everywhere. And we have some deep hills and hollers and so forth, but we also have homes and neighbor, you know, neighborhoods, et cetera, roads everywhere. So there's more reports. And honestly, there's been a lot of reports in Kentucky, but people did not realize it. When I started my organization in 97, like four years after Matt, I got all the reports because when you Googled Kentucky Bigfoot, my site came up number one. I started getting all the reports and the BFRO didn't at the time. So I built a huge database. Now the BFRO is caught up and that's why you see more. And I'm also a BFRO investigator as well. So you see more at the BFRO, but I've got a ton and I've even got more. I don't publish because I want to protect those areas or protect the witness. And, you know, and I know that's every state, but um, sure. Kentucky, um, we're in the triangle. You, you got Ohio, which is hot, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and you can extend that down to Tennessee. I mean, we're in an area where there's just a ton of Bigfoot activity. So, so go, ahead. go ahead, Brad. No, I was going to say, you know, I don't know. You know, the listeners like to hear all kinds of interesting things. Have you actually, have you had a sighting, Charlie? Uh, you know, <laughs> everybody asks you that. Sure. No, no, not really. I mean, okay. one time about, gosh, 100 yards away, down a creek on a sunny day, two black figures crossed the creek, typical stride. Mm -hmm. We drove around both sides to see where they went. It was swamp. There were no trucks. Uh, it was middle of winter. They were completely black. It was a Bigfoot hotspot. But can I say those were Bigfoot? No. So, so you, you didn't have that 
that experience where you're walking down the trail, turn around, and there's a Bigfoot standing two feet from you and growling at you like mad or anything like that? No, no. Okay. Um, again, Give him a picture of that, Charlie. Like, yeah. I was in the woods, uh, see, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I was in this place on Sunday, and I always have an image of when I see my, you know, I saw a Bigfoot, I believe, a couple years ago, but it was just a brief second, you know, from 40 yards away. And I have it in my mind what it's going to look like. I see it walking down the hollow. It's like 60 or 70 yards from me. It turns and looks at me and keeps walking. And I was in some woods on Sunday and I thought this might be the place where I saw where I see it happening. Yeah. Do you have a place like right now you kind of think, you know, this could be where I see it or oh, yeah. it happens? Yeah, I've got I've got like four spots in Kentucky where I've had amazing interactions tons of witnesses um these areas and i wish we had the resources financially to bring in drones with thermals and the manpower i could if somebody had the money we could encompass this area and i don't know if we could surround them but man i bet you we could we could get one on video or i don't think you're gonna catch one but um there's areas where the probability goes way up and that's why I do my expeditions there. Uh, that's why I go there a lot. Um, and I only hope, Russ, that I see it at 60 yards away. I don't want to see it up close. Right. And you want to see it during the day. Daytime, yeah. I want to see daytime. Yeah. Um, preferably for my car. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. Um, yeah, there's areas that your chances go up. And which here's what's crazy. <laughs> Researchers who have a sighting, right? Like say Tom Shea. Well, hell, he's in an area where there's lots of evidence, you know, reports and tracks. And and of course he's going to have a sighting eventually because their probability goes up that you're there all the time. Right. So eventually, you know, we're going to get one, right? Yeah, because remember, Ray, the Bigfoot witnesses, the only thing that they have in common is geographic. It's not demographic because it's people that live in an area where a Bigfoot is, you know, so, and of course the most common sighting is a road sighting. So that could be anybody that drives, whether they're in the woods or not in the woods, but they just live in a certain area. It's interesting. Yeah. Let me ask you um, about Daniel Boone. And I know that people will probably ask you about this, but if people haven't heard, you know, Daniel Boone came through Appalachia. He used to live in Charleston. He had a fort there. There's a tree that still has his initials by a mineral spring. He thought West Virginia got too crowded. He moved to Kentucky. And before he passed away, uh, he said that he had regretted shooting a Yahoo, which in West Virginia and Kentucky is a common name for Bigfoot, which I believe it came from the book Gulliver's Travels, which was very popular with the early settlers. Mm -hmm. And they had tall ape-like creatures in that book. And I kind of thought that's where he, um, you know, got that from. And I know that in the Daniel Boone National Forest in Eastern Kentucky, that there is a, uh, I, I'm, I'm a Yahoo halfway, Springs. I, I'm just FYI, I'm halfway through the life of Daniel Boone, by the way. The book, the audio book, book. Here somewhere too. Mm -hmm. So uh, he has yet to mention a Bigfoot. So I'm are you in the one, the book that has it? Cause there's quite a few biographies. I don't know. John Mack, uh, Farragher is doing it. Um, I don't know. I'd have life to, and legend of an American pioneer. Yeah, there's Daniel a lot of Daniel Boone books, but there's right. one specific one that mentions it. I, I'd have to look it up to see which one it was. I've forgotten. But, um, but so what do you know about that, Charlie? Um, okay. It's interesting you say that because, <clears throat> as you know, Daniel Boone was in Kentucky in the, mm -hmm. in the late 1700s for many years. Um, Boonesboro is a fort. Actually, from where I live and by the, the Daniel Boone National Forest, Boonesboro is only like 30 minutes from where I live now. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't know that. And when he was in Boonesboro, the late, late 1700s, there's a couple stories, and I'll share a brief, a brief uh, summary. One of them was one day, uh, I guess he was napping, and the Shawnee kidnapped his daughter and a friend while they were canoeing on the Kentucky River. Daniel went looking for them for three days. 
and and brought his daughter and friend back from the Shawnee. Okay. Another story was the Shawnee stole some of his horses. They went to Ohio. So Daniel took his son, and, and they both were excellent marksmen, as you know. They went to Ohio. They came up right by my motel, Clay City, Mount Sterling. Right this path is called the Warrior's Path. It's a documented path where it's near Buffalo Trace and so forth, where people would go up to Ohio. He came right through here, went up to, uh, I think it's the Salt Lick River, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, by the Ohio River, when they got there, he built a raft, and him and his son crossed the Ohio, and there were like 300 Shawnee waiting for him. Wow. So he, you know, wisely turned around. Well, when he came back to Boonesboro, they like to look for food, right? They like to look for resources. So his son and Daniel would not hike together. They would separate. So they're on different ridges. They're walking down. And he hears his son fire multiple shots. He thought, that's odd. You know, why is he shooting multiple times? He's a, he's a marksman and he shouldn't miss so to speak. So Daniel rushed to that other ridge and there's this 10 foot tall hairy creature with his son lifted up, throws it, throws his son down. Daniel rushes up close enough to fire off a shot, hitting it in the face. He hits it actually in the eye and kills it instantly. Now I've researched this. I, I found two places, two sources of the same story. Um, which, you know, for years I thought, how could you kill it, right, with a crude rep weapon back then? Today people shoot them and they can't kill them, right, with mm -hmm. high-powered rifles and they, the Bigfoot runs off. You hear that all the time. How could Daniel kill this thing? Well, it makes sense if he acts, you know, luckily got it in the eye right to the brain. Yeah, no bone, straight right. shot. Yeah, straight shot, boom. So Daniel rushes over there, revives his son, they take in their walking sticks and they measure it. They get back to Boonesboro and they determine it was like 10 feet, six inches tall. It was, it was more blonde in color, hairy. Um, I'm excited about that because where that happened, there's a creek. They named the creek. That's only four miles from my motel right now, right where I am right now. Wow. What they name of the creek? Uh, Lubbagrud Creek, which stands for something in Indian, or I don't know, Lubbagrud Lubbagrud Creek, and um, so what's what's crazy about that? Okay, um, at this motel, I've got a Bigfoot cutout, of course, out by the road, and people stop and get their pictures with the Bigfoot, and I I was selling them for a while, and this guy come in, and he goes, "Hey, I want to buy one of your cutouts." Okay, he goes. I got to tell you, I grew up here, okay, and I'm I'm 50-something, I'm your age. He goes, look out the window over there, and across the parkway from the motel, there's a big ridge. He goes, my, my uncle owned that ridge, and as kids, we would play, you know, with no shirts on, just our shorts, and run around, and, and um, he said one day, this couple from Florida, they were driving down the parkway, they stopped. And they back up and they go, hey, can we take your all's picture? We've never seen Kentucky hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> so the, he goes, oh, yeah, we obliged. We're like honored. So we run over there. We we pose for the camera. And he goes, but the more to the story was when we were kids, we would play hide and seek. And one time at night, a big hairy creature ran right by us. As we're hiding, he said, I could tell it was covered in hair. It was massive. And we just were quiet. We just sat there in the dark and it ran right by us. I go, where was that? Lubbergrud Creek. Now, that's, what, how many years is that? 200 years ago? Um, you know, of course, it's not the same Bigfoot or. Sure. But if they, when we know they breed, they reproduce. And yeah, usually they're in the same areas. This, this could have been, could have been one of his kin. Right. Daniel Boone shot, you know, who knows? But it's sure. interesting that it's the same creek. That's cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, I could be I could be really excited about that. I know that you know you're always excited when you get a report close to someplace that you've had an experience or you know one that's close to your house or one especially one that uh, I remember one time I took a report from a nurse in the Cranberry Wilderness area in West Virginia, which is the largest wilderness area in the eastern US. And she was a good witness and and I thought, gosh, this is a cool report. And I drove up there a couple of times, but it's just so much wilderness when you get out, you're like, what do I do now? You know what I mean? There's, it's not like when I go to Ohio, there's roads seven or eight miles away or six miles or four miles. So I'm kind of boxed in where I'm looking, you know, up there, it may be, I don't know, up to 21 miles between the next road and it's very steep. And uh, then about a couple of years later, I got a report from a medical doctor and his wife, same road, same mountain, same place. And man, it just ate at me. I just needed to know, like, I had these maps. I always have maps out at least a couple times a week. I'm looking at them, but you know, what, why is it there? What, you know, what is it about that one spot that makes it, you know, want to be there? I had cameras up there and a video camera up there for a long time. And that was where I first discovered that sometimes when they go into areas, you'll see a disruption in the normal wildlife. And I realized it wasn't all just about getting a picture of a Bigfoot on a camera. Of course, I want one badly, but it was it helped me learn about where they may be. And even if my camera's, you know, being heard or they saw it or whatever it is, that it, it isn't working, you know, it helps me, uh, you know, push it along a little bit. But I never did figure out. I knew there used to be a, a beaver dam that was over there. The state eventually went in and knocked down and, you know, everything goes to a beaver dam if there's one around. So I'm not sure if it was it was that or what it was yeah it is it is exciting when you get clusters and you're yes. like oh my gosh i've got a private google map of every county and i've got these clusters of reports and just recently i've got a couple of reports new ones i got a report from just a couple of weeks ago i mean oh my gosh that's right where these other reports happened and this witness had no idea because i don't publish on my website the exact spots right so i'm like i don't know it's exciting to see a bunch of them in one spot yeah you know sometimes because we don't have much data two or three sightings is a lot you know i mean that's really exciting to get two or three just in the same general area yeah. you know let me ask you charlie and i'm sure i've asked you this over the years since i've known you a long time but there was rumors that a couple of the politicians from Kentucky, mm -hmm. and I won't name them, but they're as big a politicians as we have really in our country, um, have had Bigfoot sightings. Have you heard that before? Yeah, I'll name them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, Brad and I are always in trouble anyway. So. <laughs> supposedly, I'll just say supposedly. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul, who are both in Kentucky, had bigfoot sightings together or separate separate okay. um separate areas i think Rand paul's down by bowling green which is by mammoth cave and uh mitch is up up towards lexington um so here's what's interesting about that and i'll i'll say because bobo won't mind me saying it bobo's the one who told me okay it was my source <laughs> um and I don't think he was smoking anything when he told me that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lauren Coleman was on a plane sitting next to Match Mitch McConnell. And he posted on Facebook, guess who I'm sitting next to? And he took a picture of Mitch McConnell, right? Sitting next yeah. to him. Sure. I kind of remember that. And I said right on there, I go, ask him about his Bigfoot sighting. I'm not joking. He must, he asked him because he said he doesn't want to talk about it. So why wouldn't you just deny it? Why wouldn't right. you laugh and say, oh, pff, that's crazy? Right. No, that's just urban legend. So Bobo asked him and he said, I don't want to talk about it. No, no, not Bobo. Um, Lauren Coleman. Lauren, oh, Lauren, I mean. Lauren asked him and he said, him. I don't want to talk to him. Yeah. I, did you have a big Bigfoot sighting? And um, Mitch said, I don't want to talk about it. Wow. I mean, that's, I'd love to, be, love to hear that story. Right. So, yeah. so there's a story that, uh, you know, before we run out of time here, 
you told me this story. Um, we had a uh, a guy on a podcast, and he was into government conspiracies and the hiding of Bigfoot information. And we had this whole hour discussion. And your name came up because there was a story that you told me, and he had heard the story from you about the cornbread mafia. <laughs> yeah. About what? The cornbread mafia. <clears throat> I, I don't even know what that means. You don't know what the cornbread mafia is? That's <laughs> no. that let Charlie no. <laughs> Charlie can tell the story. He's the first hand witness. He talked to this gentleman, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um little background. If you go to A and E and you find the story about um, Crystal Rogers, <clears throat> she was killed in Bardstown, Kentucky. And there's an entire show on A and E about the mystery of who killed her, and then all these other people that were killed around the same time period. Uh, a law enforcement officer was ambushed. He got off the park, the interstate, and they had some debris on the exit ramp. He got out to move it, and he was shot by somebody waiting for him. And they don't know why. They don't know, you know the reason. But there's a lot of things tied to this, and I don't want to go into it at all. But that area is known for suspicious activity, okay? Um, that area is not too far from Fort Knox. So the story goes... I had a guy contact me by email. I want to come on one of your expeditions, but I want to know, is there a, a hospital nearby? And I'm like, ah, I better call him because where we're going, there's no hospital. So I called him and I'm on my cell phone and um, he goes, yeah, I guess I shouldn't come, but I'm a knower, not a believer. I go, Really? Luckily, my phone has an app that records conversations when I interview witnesses. And luckily, it was left on because I always turn it off. But there's sometimes I forget and it's always on. I got phone conversations on my brother and my mother by accident. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, so, I'm so thankful it was left on. He goes, well, he was, form, was a former sergeant at Fort Knox and they were back in the was in the eighties. They were eradicating the marijuana on the outskirts of Fort Knox, because Fort Knox are thousands of acres, and they just back up the individual property. Okay, there's no wall around Fort Knox, and they were eradicating the marijuana with local PD. And he said, "We're in a one one three, I think it was a track vehicle," and the helicopter above said, "Hey, we have some individuals up here." He goes, man, we were fast. We got up there real quick, and there was there was five creatures, as he called them. There was a big male, black. There was a female, he thought, reddish brown. Her leg was hung up in a bear trap. He said, almost torn off. The, the, the big male had the chain in his hand, and then the two younger ones were a little bit lighter in color, the juvies. And the mother had a little black one in its arms. He said, when we got up there, that big male dropped the chain. It roared. It came towards our vehicle, and we opened up on them. I mean, dropping all of them except the little one. The little one got away. And I was heartbroken. When I heard this story, and you can hear the interview, I, you can hear me say, like, did you feel remorseful? Like, I mean, why would you kill him? He goes, man, when that thing came at us and it, we dropped it about, I don't know, 12 foot from the track, I go, we were scared. This thing's massive. I go, yeah, I guess I could, I could see that. Um, another sergeant and another vehicle came up, say, said, stay in your vehicle. He walked up and he put a round with his pistol in each ear hole. Um, I said, did you get out to look at him? He goes, no, they took a stop. Uh, Ireland Army Hospital in Fort Knox. We were debriefed. Uh, you know, a man with white hair came in and 
Uh, they gave us shots. They took our battle dress uniforms. Um, it's almost like they had an entire protocol in place. That's what he he sensed. There was an entire protocol. And um, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I go, why are you telling me this? And unfortunately, um, he had terminal cancer. So he had about a year to live. And um, I spoke to him afterwards. And uh, I told him I recorded that conversation. He said, you know, after I pass away, you can share that. But uh, don't just don't share it now because I have a daughter in the area and so forth. I said, okay, well, um, <clears throat> I can go in more, more detail about that story, but it's on my YouTube channel, the okay. entire thing recorded. What, um, what is your YouTube channel, Charlie? Um, <laughs> you go to it through KentuckyBigfoot.com. So KentuckyBigfoot.com, you scroll down, YouTube. I think it's at Kentucky Bigfoot. Okay. That's the thing at Kentucky Bigfoot. Well, I'll, I'll find it and post a link in the in the description. When we post it's remarkable. I, I shared that story with people. Uh, they're blown away by it. Um, it 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 was sad because I don't want to kill one, um, but it just reaffirmed. Or you don't want to be killed by one either. <laughs> right. right. <I> <laughs> Yeah, you never know. If I was in the situation, maybe I would have done that. I don't it, know. But is is I mean, being from Kentucky, is it is it plausible that they had bear trap up there, or were they did they have bear traps not no. because of bears, because of marijuana? Right, like the cornbread mafia, the the marijuana patches, they will kill you. Sure, literally kill you if you you know give away their income, um, turn them in. So, uh, yeah, they would booby trap their marijuana fields. Um, so the story goes, here's a crazy thing. I had a guy at the, at the Ohio conference come up to me. He goes, I heard that story before. I go, really? He goes, it didn't happen in Kentucky. I go, really? I go, let me know where you heard it because I, I want to know if this is BS. Okay. So after the conference, he contacts me. He sends me the report. The guy had actually went on a pod, another YouTube channel prior to talking to me. Uh, months prior, okay, I didn't know this, and they recorded the entire conversation, identical to what he told me, but more detail. The the creator of the YouTube channel had passed away, so he's no longer out there, but he sent me the YouTube clip. It was Kentucky. It was Fort Knox. It was more detailed, and I argued with a few people saying, okay, I didn't know that. He never. I never even asked him if he told the story before. I just assumed I'm the first person. So it wasn't like he said, you're the first person I'm telling. He might have wanted to get it off his chest, and he told somebody prior to me, right? But it just reconfirms that the story was pretty accurate, detail for detail. Um, uh, it was maybe he, because he had terminal cancer, he wanted to get it off his chest, Um I don't know, I, but in the, in that audio clip, which he did not know I was recording it, you could scroll down in, in the comments. I put the link to the first re, first time he reported it. You can listen to it. You can compare it. Um, Fort Knox, there's been many sightings around Fort Knox. I spoke at a library nearby there one, one time. After the, the, the Bigfoot presentation, there's a guy in the back of the audience he reminded me of Indiana Jones, you know, with the, the hat. And and I finish and I walk to the parking lot. He goes, excuse me, sir, can I talk to you? Sure. He goes, I'm like um, fishing game for Fort Knox. But he had, he had a title for it. He goes, I have some, I have some stories for you. <laughs> but I was rushing, packing my vehicle, and we had to go eat pizza with our friends. You know, we're like, okay. Give me your name and number, or here's my I'll go, here's my card. You call me, right? That was my mistake. I gave him my card. He must have got cold feet because he never did contact me after that. But he was compelled. I guess I had motivated him during my presentation to yeah. come up and say, Hey, listen, I got some stories. And then he thought twice about it. You know, so I bet that made you sick in retrospect, didn't it? Yeah, I wish I would have took the time. To talk to him. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've missed witnesses like that. You know that uh, 
you know, just like when we were talking tonight, there was a woman that, uh, you know, I told that I would reach out or something. And I don't remember it was earlier today and I just hadn't got to it yet. Yeah. You know, and you're texting and seeing, and you, they're just gone. They change their mind quick after they yeah. think about it. Number one, number two, they, the details are lost. If it's a recent sighting, they lose the details um, or embellish it or it changes. So it's important to contact them right away, you know, while the iron's hot, so to speak, and get it. And I'll share one story with you guys if you don't care, because it's a new one. Yeah, yeah we'd uh, love to hear it. All yeah. right, so let me tell you, so then we're almost out of time. I'd love to hear it, but the listeners would love to hear it more. Charlie. All right, so this one just happened a couple weeks ago. All right, so here's the story. The guy's a veteran. He's also a former law enforcement. Um, he heard whistling around his property. He owns 28, 28 acres. He has like a two acre pond on his property. The house sat vacant for like two years before they moved in. And he started hearing whistling. And this was like two or three in the morning. He had, he had trouble sleeping. He would hear the whistling sometimes. So one time he walked to the window upstairs Looked in his backyard, and there's, there's a giant concrete pad. There's some old lumber back there. The Amish used to own this property, and they were trying to clear the lumber once they bought it. And he sees what he thought was a bear by the lumber. So he goes, and he had night vision. And he gets his night vision, and he's looking at it. The thing stands up on two legs. He said it wasn't a bear. No muzzle. You know, it looked. It had wide shoulders. It looked humanoid, covered in hair, and it walked off. And he was pretty shooken up by, about it. He was so taken back by it, trying to process it. He didn't even tell his family for days, okay? Because he's like, am I crazy? Did I see what I saw, you know? And um, so finally he told his wife and kids. And another night then, a couple of weeks later, he hears the whistling again. This time he goes downstairs. He goes around through his outside garage. It's a, it's a barn. He walks through. The creature is by that wood pile, like almost like it's eating something out of the wood pile. And he sat there for a while watching it. He said, I made no noise. I had my gun on my side. I just watched it. And there's enough light from the building and ambient light from the sky. I can see it was covered in hair. It stood up and looked at me. And then it took two steps towards me. And being former law enforcement, he put his hand out and he grabbed his pistol. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, no, he's trained to do. Like, the creature stuck its hand out like this. It did the same gesture to him. So he thought that was odd. And I love this part of the story. He goes, I don't know why I did this. I took my hand. I went like this. The, the Bigfoot did the same thing. It took his hand and went like this. Mimicked him. Mimicked him. This is a juvie, by the way. It's about a little over six foot tall because we did we did a reenactment. We measured and everything. We went there last week. So we think it was a juvie, okay? Covered in reddish brown hair. Um, <clears throat> no muzzle, no ears. It was a Bigfoot. Wide shoulders, real wide shoulders. So we investigated that. And he goes, um... Then it turned and walked off the concrete pad, and he goes, but it didn't step in the clay. You could tell it was careful where it stepped. It stepped on these patches of grass. That's interesting. Once and again, then, trying not to leave a track. Yeah, yeah. It was. He said and, he, he mentioned that. It was really and, weird. And that's something that a lot of people, um, you know, may not know about a squatch or a Bigfoot that they tend not to leave tracks and they're cognizant of it. Yeah. So that leads credence to the man's story. Yeah. It was odd that he added that. And I could see, listen, I could see me doing that. I could see it mimic me. Right. I put my hand out. It does it. I could see me like, is it copying me? Like without even thinking, like Simon says, like I could see me doing that. It was funny. He mentioned yeah. that. Probably wiping the sweat off his brow. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I Charlie, I had to ask though, because it raised its hands up, so it was not in the same area. I know there was a well-known Bigfoot that they used to call Howdy or whatever in Kentucky. They used to wave to people. Yeah, it was not in that area. No. So okay. Yeah, much too far away. Um, this was more like a mimicking thing. The Howdy thing was more 
it must have learned that over the years, you know, what we do because it would, would do that. Yeah. Um, but which is really hilarious. Which is hilarious. And it's funny. I'll tell this real quick. And in, in, um, this was actually a Tennessee conference. I spoke and a guy comes up after my conference because I spoke about Howdy, you know, raising its arm up to people. He goes, oh, my God, I, I about fell out of my seat. He goes, I'm from Illinois. And when I was a boy, it's a long story, but basically I saw this creature stand up and it put its hand up like that. In Illinois? In Illinois, yeah. I got the whole thing documented. But he goes, I've never heard that before until you told that story in Kentucky. And that's what that creature did. It stuck his hand up. Well, well how, how many times do you, you know, my parents are from Kentucky, so I can say things about the state. <laughs> um, you know, you go even, even in southern Ohio. I don't know people. You're driving down the road or everybody just waves at you. Hey, oh, you yeah. know, everybody, hey. You know, yeah. who's that? My wife's like, who's that? I, I don't know. idea who that is. It's just some guy, yeah. you know, I look friendly. I don't know, but everybody just waves at everybody. You know, these Bigfoot's probably walking through people's yards and people just don't, Hey, there's Bob. It must be Bob. <laughs> yeah. That's not it is, Bob. It, it's true. Yeah. Uh, when I moved to Kentucky, I realized that right away because I asked the person next to me, do you know that person? No, that's what we do here. We just wave. Right. And I said, well, Florida, where I'm from, we stick one finger up. <laughs> well, Charlie, you know, we really appreciate you taking time to come on with us. And you made an hour pass so quickly. And, you know, you're one of truly the good guys in the field. And Bigfoot has a lot of good guys in it. But, you know, you're right up there. And everybody loves Charlie Raymond. And, you know, I think that if uh, you want to go on an expedition that's well run, you'd have to go quickly. You know, he told you what his website is but he sells out just so fast. You just can't believe it. So, uh, so that, go ahead, Brian. That was uh, www.kentuckybigfoot.com, correct? Yeah. Charlie? And you're on Instagram, uh, Facebook. All, yeah, all, all that all stuff. Things. Okay. YouTube if, channel. <clears throat> so what happens is like your podcast, people want to hear the stories, especially sure. from the witness. Sure. So I am being lazy. I don't like to type. I've been doing more and more audio recordings and video recordings of witnesses. So if you go there, go, go to my YouTube and listen to these stories. Like the one I just told you, listen to the witness, tell that story. Okay. That's you know? a, that's a whole different spin. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of people don't do that. You know what I mean? Maybe they don't want to be heard or whatever, but I'm glad that it's out there and you're doing that because that does give a firsthand account mm -hmm. of the witness and people can see, the emotion here, the inflection in her voice and, you know, get that feeling that, you know, these people aren't, aren't telling stories, you know, they're, they're telling a story, but it's a true story. So yeah. they're not making things up. Yeah. Right. We didn't even get to talk about the stuff I had written down to ask him. We were just on the <laughs> other stuff. Well, that's how we come on another time to cover those things. Yeah. Let's well, do it again because I've got hundreds of stories. Um, I want to ask you guys, you know, about your sightings, your, your research. Okay. We'll, we'll have to do that. We'll, so, we'll set you up, Charlie. So are you going to be at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference this year? Are you going? No, I was there last year as the MC. Right. Um, but I'm just so busy, okay. to be honest. I, I so so you are located. What's, what city are you located in? Clay City. Uh, so, it's a small, small town right by the Red River Gorge. We have a little motel. It's going to be a Bigfoot motel. We've got Bigfoot decor. Our two rooms we renovated. They're, they're brand new rooms. You walk in, the first thing you see in one of them is a sketch of Patty that an artist had done of her face. Right. And That's I, cool. I got, the, I got the little details about Patty. And so when strangers come in, they're like, oh my gosh, what is that? But I, I have a little description about you know what it is. And but it's a fun place to stay. We've got Bigfoot reports all right. around. You. So instead of if, if you're from the East Coast, um, you can't make it out to Cliff's Museum. You can come to Charlie's in Clay City, correct? Clay City, yeah, Kentucky. Clay City, Kentucky. Uh, you got eight or would you say eight rooms? You've got eight a, rooms. You're, you're redoing them. Um, you can talk to the man himself because you're probably there every day. Yeah. Um, and his beautiful wife that's just as interested in Bigfoot as he is. Correct. Yep. And uh, you guys can have a conversation, learn some things, and maybe he can turn you on to some hot spots to go around yep. maybe and, and see. If we make things. it out there in April, I think that's where Brad and I want to stay instead of staying in. 
I you know, stand. the back of my truck. I don't stay in the fence. <laughs> I'm too old. Well, listen, um, that if you guys come here, we'll put you up in a room. Uh, love to have you speak if you want to speak because you know your knowledge is amazing. Um, but it's near, it's near here. It's, okay, it's forty minutes from the motel, so it's not too far. But it's a it's a super hot spot where I've got the report I just told you. Yeah, is near, is near there. The dogman report I just told you. I didn't tell you the report, but that's real close to there. Let's uh, not have a dogman. I don't. I yeah. But we draw the line. We draw yeah. the line at dog. Yeah. Man. Here's what's crazy about the dogman. I'm just gonna throw it out there real quick. When he told me this story, he goes, "I don't want to tell people where it's at because um, he was worried about someone getting hurt." Blah blah blah. His testimony is on my on my YouTube too. You can listen to it. I go to Google. And I've taken so many reports over the years. I pull my Google map up. I go, holy shit. His report is right across the street where I documented a Bigfoot report years ago. Wow. Yeah. I think we should make t-shirts that instead of saying untold on here, it says like it has the a snout or a dog man with a slash through it. Like, you know, no snout, no nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna participate in that. Anti dog man. Yeah, right. anti dog man. Not not because of whatever, but just, I don't really want to see one. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I just report it. But I, like yeah. I said, I report. And there's credible people I interviewed, but I don't. I don't go that route. I'm I'm mostly Bigfoot, but yeah, uh, I just report what people tell me. All right. All right, Charlie. Thanks again, my friend. You're welcome, guys. Till the next time. All right. Good night. <laughs>